Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chatham House. I'm Robin Niblett, director of the Institute. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening on a cold, blustery London evening, but for a very hot and current topic. Um, British-Irish relationship, past, present and future. I suspect, uh, Tanishta, that there will be a fair amount of present and future in the Q&A, but I know that, uh, not least given that we're celebrating this year the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, that there's a situating this relationship in its uh, historical context is a particularly important step uh, to take today and really to underscore the importance of this most central bilateral relationship, not just for the Republic of Ireland, but also for the United Kingdom. Um, so uh, this is a meeting on the record, and we're welcoming you back to Chatham House, because we did have the pleasure of hearing some of your views uh, last year uh, in a private roundtable meeting. Um, but uh, Simon Coveney, who took up the position as Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, back in June 2017, also took on the Tanishta, the Deputy Prime Minister position uh, in November of last year. Uh, joined uh, the Doyle in 98, but has had a, a great succession of important offices in Cabinet, Minister of Defence, Minister of Agriculture, and Minister of Housing, Foreign Affairs. Um, it's been a, uh, and is um, a great uh, career, and one that's really going to give you, I think, a particularly uh, rounded view of the challenges, not just facing Ireland, but of course also the Brexit process and what this means uh, for Ireland at so many uh, different levels. Um, thank you very much again for joining us, for sharing your thoughts. We'll hear your remarks uh, first here, and then we'll have plenty of time uh, to take questions from you, our members of Chatham House. And let me also welcome those members who are joining us uh, via our live stream. Um, great to have you all with us, and especially to initiate to have you with us today. Welcome to Chatham House, and welcome back, and look forward to your remarks. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the welcome again here. I think this is my third time here now, uh, and uh, uh, I hope I'll have the opportunity to come back again in the future. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you this evening to talk about something uh, that has always been a significant part of my life, and that is the relationship between these two islands. Um, I think maybe it's important to say that it is important to express positive sentiments at the best possible junctures by that I mean before the Six Nations, of course, <laughs> this year. Um, but I want to thank uh, Robin in particular uh, for, his, uh, for his hosting of me here uh, again on, uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, the rule of this house uh, has become widely accepted uh, as a way for politicians and policy makers to speak the truth. Uh, a partially closed door behind which we can truly engage with each other speak our minds freely and honestly, as friends should, of course, be doing. However, on this occasion, we're not operating under these rules. Uh, um, and I'm pleased in this case. Uh, I see a real value, actually, in reflecting very publicly on the vital relationship at a time of great change and uncertainty between Britain and Ireland. Too often in the past, our bilateral relationship seems to be defined by Northern Ireland and its difficulties, the political differences and, of course, the violent conflicts and the differing perspectives from Dublin and London. Now, and over the last 18 months particularly, there is a danger that our relationship could be defined primarily uh, or, or almost exclusively now by Brexit. I believe, in fact, I know our relationship is deeper and richer and more enduring than the current focus on the EU's departure from the, the, the UK's departure <laughs> from the a slight fraudulent slip there, um, fr from the EU, of course. We should probably think a bit more about that statement, actually. <laughs> uh, just as our relationship has always uh, uh, been multi-layered and complex, uh, uh, as indeed uh, the, uh, the context in which we uh, continue to discuss and work together uh, in relation to Northern Ireland uh, and the troubles uh, in that part of the United Kingdom and Ireland. So we can't be complacent. 
we have to work to maintain the habit of cooperation, as I like to call it, that we have known over the past four decades, working side by side in Brussels and indeed elsewhere. Like all good friends, there needs to be honesty and trust. While we often, usually in fact, agree, we should be able to disagree too. Uh, in fact, I'd go further. The capacity to disagree openly and honestly and then move on is a mark of the kind of friendship that I think our countries need to have. In the past, we had to work hard to develop and nurture this relationship, despite all of the challenges. And we will have to keep on doing that. Uh, as we will lose the habit of cooperation around the EU table, we'll have to use our existing bilateral mechanisms to much greater effect. We are fortunate that there are, are already a number of East-West institutions, uh, such as the British-Irish Council and the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference, uh, which could be utilised to a much fuller degree, in my view. We also have the British-Irish Parliamentary Assembly and regular meetings uh, of all our, of our permanent secretaries and general secretaries in terms of government cooperation. And we may have to imagine a new too, in order to sustain our relationship and those connections that are so important. For instance, I think we need to consider whether through uh, new structures or perhaps existing ones, we should examine seriously the possibility of bringing both governments together annually in London or in Dublin on alternative years to discuss issues of mutual cooperation and concern. And I don't mean simply ensuring that our leaders meet at Taoiseach and Prime Minister level. I'm talking about a more complete discussion that involves cabinets and governments uh, and their advisors. This annual summit of all senior ministers would allow for cooperation across a broad range of shared interest. Everything from energy to the environment, from transport to technology to employment to future trade opportunities and so on. This is what neighbours should be doing. It could also be prepared for in the preceding weeks and months by teams of officials from re relevant departments and ministries, which again I think would focus the mechanics and infrastructure of the state on looking for ways to cooperate for mutual interest. These structures matter as much because of the personal, inter personal interactions they help facilitate uh, as any kind of formal agenda. As the UK departs, the European Union. We don't want to lose the kind of cooperation that can be fostered from a simple conversation in a corridor or a cup of tea or coffee on the margins of a meeting. British and Irish politicians and officials need to keep working and meeting together to ensure that the understanding we have uh, of each other does not diminish. This should be our shared future. But let me look backwards for a moment. It's perhaps an understatement to say that our shared history is a complex one and at times has not been easy. There are, some might, there are some who might look back hundreds of years to make their case in that respect, but I don't think that's really necessary. Within many of our lifetimes, there were periods when being Irish in Britain was deeply uncomfortable. And indeed, being Britain in Ireland wasn't a whole lot better. And looking back at the archives, it is clear that we didn't always have the channels and contacts between Dublin and London that should have been there to address difficulties or knocks or missteps in our relationship. On occasion, the diplomatic contacts were good and yielded dividends. I can think of the great diplomatic work of early Irish governments, which worked with their Canadian and Australian and, yes, British counterparts to peacefully loosen ties with London and to allow us to step out as a more fully independent state on the world stage. We can recall the negotiations in the 1930s which peacefully uh, and in agreement with London dismantled some difficult legacies of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And we can think also of the free trade negotiations of the 1960s and preparations for us joining the European Economic Community as it, as it then was, together 
1973. However, these connections seem to falter uh, during the early years of the conflict in Northern Ireland. They weren't, uh, they weren't uh, as strong as they should have been. And it seemed for a time that our relationship would always be hampered and strained by that conflict, and indeed mediated almost exclusively through the prism of it. And yet, despite the pressures, we eventually found ways of working together to resolve that conflict. And one of the great unforeseen gifts of the peace process was that by working together, we did rekindle a relationship. And we brought it to a level of positivity that previous generations probably couldn't have imagined. This yielded the Good Friday, or the Belfast Agreement, which marks its 20th anniversary this year. The genius of the agreement is that it provides a framework for the totality of the relationships on our two islands, between communities in Northern Ireland, between North and South, on the island of Ireland, and across the Irish Sea, underpinned by international support from both the EU and the US. I'm always struck by just how carefully woven together these relationships are, despite the great forces and pressures of history, and by the intricacy and balance of the agreement's fundamental framework, with each of the three interlocking relationships reinforcing the other. Strengthen one, and you strengthen them all. Damage one, and you damage them all, as we are currently seeing in the context of a lack of devolved government in Belfast. And the agreement removed barriers and borders both physically on the island of Ireland and emotionally between communities in Ireland and between the two islands. Hence, our very real concerns about the implications of Brexit, especially a hard Brexit, for our island and our shared peace process. Despite current political difficulties, it is right and proper that we collectively mark the anniversary of the agreement, if only to recall once again the core tenets at its heart and the centrality of the interlocking relationships on and between these islands. We would forget them at our collective cost. Before I inevitably turn to Brexit, it's impossible to avoid that subject <laughs> when you're in this great country, or, or in mine at the moment. Uh, let's take a moment to look at the richer, deeper, more complex relationship that I spoke about earlier. I believe it was captured well by our Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, speaking in the European Parliament two weeks ago. Uh, there he spoke of the importance to him and to the Irish people of our relationship with the United Kingdom. He spoke of his Irish mother, who was a nurse, and how she met and married his Indian father, who was a doctor here in England. How his sister lives here uh, uh, with his uh, English-born niece and nephew. This isn't an uncommon story. I too have deep personal ties with this country. I studied here for four years. Uh, I worked uh, in just outside Edinburgh for a period of time. My mother held a British passport for most of her life. Uh, most of, her, well, half of her family are very English and very proud to be. Uh, my brother uh, runs a company that employs more people in Britain than any other Irish company nearly 13,000 people. Um, so I and many of the other decision makers and many other Irish people uh, have a personal vested interest in the future of Britain as a country that we love and have been part of at different parts in our lives. To say Ireland and the UK are close friends and neighbours is therefore a lot more than some platitude. It is the reality of our lives. Over many generations, Britain has been the first place where our people sought work uh, when our own economy faltered. And unfortunately, that has happened on more than a number of occasions. Emigrants came here to find work and in doing so provided Britain with a much needed labor force that built, and indeed after the Second World War, rebuilt much of the physical infrastructure in your great cities. And they built the social infrastructure too these were the teachers and the nurses who taught and cared 
for people in this country here in London and Liverpool and Manchester and beyond, leaving a legacy of a deeply integrated Irish community, which has contributed greatly to the development of the Britain that we know today. In more recent times, as Ireland's third level education sector has expanded, our emigrants arrived here with a greater diversity, diversity of skills and life experience than ever before. It's no surprise then that there are now over 60,000 Irish born directors on the boards of British companies. We have a trading relationship that is worth over 55 billion pounds or 65 billion euro every year which sustains over 400,000 jobs in Britain and Ireland across both of our islands. This week, about 38,000 Irish companies will trade directly with Britain. To give you a sense and scale, that's about 10% of our workforce directly connected to that relationship. Ireland is the UK's fifth largest exporting destination. I know that in the Brexit debate here, there's a focus on the UK seeking to develop trading relations with high growth, high potential export partners. Whatever about places further afield, let me say that Ireland is one such partner, with an economy now forecast to grow again at 4.4% in 2018, probably for the fourth year in a row the fastest growing economy in the European Union. The flow of people over and back across the Irish Sea every day uh, has made the Dublin-London Air Corridor the second busiest on the planet. So business uh, and our trade relationship is currently booming. And let me be very clear about one thing. Uh, we need that to continue. Ireland needs and wants a happy and prosperous United Kingdom. And there should be no ambiguity about that in the context of the fractious negotiations that have and will continue probably to take place as we try and navigate our way through the challenges of Brexit. This helps shape the objectives we carry into the next phase of the EU-UK negotiations also. And so to Brexit. Speaking candidly, we all know that the decision of the United Kingdom to leave the EU uh, has highlighted a major policy difference on how we see our relationship with Britain or with, with Europe. And as such, uh, we will see Ireland and the UK pursue different paths in the years ahead. Without doubt, one of the core pillars of our stronger relationship over the past 40 years or so has been our shared membership of and partnership in the European Union. Stemming from our simultaneous accession as I mentioned, uh, with Denmark back in 1973, the year after I was born. Sitting around the EU table as equals and partners, our officials and political leaders have learned to work together. We learned that we shared much in common, uh, both in terms of interests, but more importantly, in terms of values. Some commentators that I've heard have asked the question, having joined together in 1973, um, should we not leave together uh, in uh, 2019? As if the intervening 45 years of membership were of no consequence. This is probably fair to say, it is probably fair to say that our journeys as member states have been quite different. Uh, it is uh, for me to speak uh, to the, uh, uh, it's not for me to speak of the UK's experience or perceptions of EU membership. However, as an Irish citizen, as I said, born just one month after our accession referendum, as a citizen who has grown up in an Ireland visibly, uh, demonstrably uh, growing and benefiting from EU membership, I feel that I'm qualified to speak of our national experience. Ireland's membership of what is now the European Union has quite simply been transformative for our country. It has allowed us to develop and grow uh, into a confident and relatively prosperous country uh, at ease with ourselves and perhaps it has helped us to be at ease with our neighbours too. Over the past 40 years, through extensive EU support, we've been able to invest in our infrastructure, our agriculture and directly our people. Working collectively with our EU partners on common foreign policy and security issues, our voice has become stronger. 
and our advocacy for a values-based world has been strengthened. Together with UN membership, EU membership has helped us. In the words uh, of one of our many patriots, Robert Emmett, uh, to take our place among the nations of the world. In Ireland, uh, we now have over 80% satisfaction rate with the EU among our population. Uh, we have a generally positive, positively disposed media. We have a young population which has benefited hugely from programs like Erasmus. Uh, and we have a science, research and enterprise base which has secured uh, about half a billion uh, euros of EU funding from Horizon 2020. We look around our EU table and we see friends and partners. We see member states which, like us, stepped out into the world stage uh, after the horrors of the First World War. We see member states which have stepped out from under the shadow of stronger neighbours. We see member states which have known conflict and famine and immigration and which now inhabit a sphere of peace and prosperity that they have grown to take for granted. In a word, we feel comfortable around this table and that's where we're going to stay. We're therefore committed to the European ideal and to our place in Europe. We are, however, deeply disappointed that our closest neighbour and ally uh, on so many issues is choosing a different course, but we respect that. The EU will be the lesser union without the United Kingdom. But Ireland's journey as a committed member of the European Union will, of course, continue. So we want to do this while maintaining the closest possible relationship with our closest neighbour and friend. And given what I've said about how our economies and societies are, are intertwined, uh, it'll come as no surprise that we have viewed the potential impact of Brexit, uh, especially uh, in certain circumstances, uh, which such, with such concern. And it should have come as no surprise either that we worked so hard with the EU task force and our fellow EU partners during phase one to protect our own vital interests, including the signature UK-Ireland achievement uh, of the Northern Ireland peace process. We're very pleased that both the UK government and, and the EU have prioritised the protection of the Good Friday Agreement and the gains of that peace process, including no return to a hard border on the island of Ireland. Uh, and that we now have firm commitments in that regard and agreement uh, on the outlines of how it can be achieved. I spent much of today focusing on that particular conversation with key decision makers here. I'm also very pleased that the common travel area has also been protected in these negotiations, allowing Irish and British people to continue to travel, to live, to work, and access a range of rights and benefits in each other's country. The common travel area isn't just about travel, actually. It's really about mutual recognition of citizenship, almost, between our two countries. We even allow each other to vote in each other's elections. So it's a special relationship that we are going to protect through Brexit. Uh, and Britain is going to protect it too, because it values it. I look forward to seeing these commitments of phase one formalised in phase two, and we should see that in the coming weeks. Uh, and we also work to ensure a very positive uh, future EU-UK relationship as a whole. Uh, I've said many times that I believe that Ireland actually will be Britain's closest friend in phase two of these negotiations. Uh, even though we were responsible for a little bit of stress in the context of trying to move on to phase two uh, during phase one negotiations in December. Uh, the outcomes, um, uh, I think, that, that we would like to see and that most British people would like to see are not dissimilar. No doubt there will be questions from the floor on Brexit-related issues, and I'll be happy to respond to them. But as our relationship shouldn't be defined primarily by Brexit, nor should this speech. I spent a lot of time talking about Brexit, so it's nice to talk about a few broader issues. I will only make one further point on our future relationship, because as I said earlier, Ireland needs and wants a happy and prosperous United Kingdom. I hope the British government and parliament will reflect carefully on the path to prosperity over the coming weeks, because they need to, because these negotiations are moving on and we are close to decision time. The most successful single market and customs union in the world, a market 
that UK genius helped to design, that market is on your doorstep. The British economy is integrated wholly into it and gains from access to it uh, to a degree that will be impossible to replicate for future, from future UK only trade deals with third countries. The EU and UK both stand to gain from the closest possible customs and regulatory partnership. And I hope the UK is ambitious in what it seeks in this respect, with an eye on what is achievable and where the EU is coming from. We've got to focus on realities in terms of what is possible at this stage in the negotiations. But I still believe a very positive outcome is possible with the right approach from both sides. <coughs> Ambition for the Irish-UK relationship is another thing. Most speeches about British-Irish relations in recent times have mentioned uh, Queen Elizabeth's visit to Ireland, uh, uh, including Cork, of course, where I come from, in 2011. Can I say, just on a personal level, that was a really, really powerful experience for many Irish people, and I suspect it was for many Irish people in this room also. Uh, I had the privilege uh, of taking Her Majesty uh, into what's called the English market in Cork City, where she was meeting traders. And actually, for the first time in her week-long visit, when she came out of the English market onto the main street in Cork, which is referred to as the rebel city in Ireland, so there was all sorts of, of connotations. Uh, which is why it was such a powerful experience in Cork, she decided herself uh, to ignore the advice uh, of her handlers and walked across the street to meet the public for the first time in Ireland. Uh, and ironically, actually, the first person she met was my grandmother. <laughs> my grandmother, who is and whose life has been a product of the Anglo-Irish relationship uh, and who always wanted to meet uh, Her Majesty in Ireland. Uh, and it was a, an extraordinarily powerful experience for her uh, and for our family, and was not a, 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 it wasn't organized by me at all. <laughs> uh, um, it, it was one of these bizarre coincidences that happened, um, but it was extraordinary. And of course, that same year, there was a reciprocal visit here by President Michael D. Higgins in 2014, which I did, which I, I hope and I think touched uh, many British hearts also. These visits were rightly seen as high points in our relationship uh, that many in generations past could scarcely have envisaged. It became a truism, perhaps uh, even a little cliched and worn, to say that relations uh, between us have never been better. When things are going well, of course, it means that you have more to lose, though. Looking forward, Ireland is choosing a different relationship with Europe than that sought by the United Kingdom, However, it does not change the fact that we will remain each other's closest neighbours and friends. And the bilateral ties between us remain deep and far-reaching and impossible to untie even if we tried to in the context of their depth. And despite recent differences, I'm happy to say that the relations between our islands remain strong and the relationship between our governments remains strong also. As, uh, as I found out today, in the context of the hospitality that I've received here. Of course, there are inevitable tensions that arise during difficult negotiations. And an issue like Brexit is exceptional in that respect. But like any close friends, these do not harm and should never threaten the foundations of our friendship. Uh, and we should be ambitious for that friendship in the future. Uh, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, uh, who I met again this morning, uh, has spoken of a bridge across the, uh, across the English Channel to Europe. Others are talking about a bridge between Larne and Port Patrick in Scotland. And I certainly see no harm in looking at the feasibility of big infrastructure projects to link our islands. Why not? If a credible economic case uh, for any uh, 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 initiative can be made in that area. But metaphorical bridges are less costly but with no less value. So I think it is useful to recall the multitude of bridges already stretching across the Irish Sea between our peoples, our governments, our businesses, our culture, our sport, science, education, uh, third, third level institutions that work together. The bridges that will allow us to continue to nurture our relationships long into the future. As President Higgins said when he spoke 
in Buckingham Palace during his state visit here in 2014. He said, Orska uh, Achela uh, Avarvij. And that translates into, we live in the shadow, but also in the shelter of one another. The relationship between our countries is both vital and full of vitality, and one which is of great value. I would urge everybody who cares about the relationship between our countries to treat it with care, to protect and nurture it, and to invest in what brings us closer together. I look forward to your questions, and thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister. Thank you um, for those remarks. Um, as you said, and it was very apparent in, in your comments there, this is a multi-layered relationship, deep physical interconnections, family interconnections, personal, uh, historical, and you, you certainly laid out the economic, a relationship that's been defined in many cases despite this by uh, conflict, uh, uh, by violence, but uh, that have been overcome. And they've been overcome largely in the context of the European Union and of the relationship that that created. And as you said here, that is one of your worries. Uh, and that's one of the worries of, of many people in the Republic of Ireland, that somehow that good work is going to get pulled apart when, as you said, you know how long I have the Brits around the table. Um, we're going to open up and get some questions in. May I take the privilege of the chair to, to dig in on one? As, as inevitably, I said, we get to the, to the present and the future. Um, uh, and I do want to get, obviously, a little bit into the Brexit issue. There may be others who want to discuss other topics here. But you said in your remarks that you hope the UK is ambitious in what it seeks to get from a future agreement. I think you then said, within the realm of what should be possible. Um, it strikes me looking at where the government is as it looks to the second phase uh, of the negotiation, to the extent that it's able to focus on that at the moment, um, that it is trying to be ambitious. The United, United Kingdom government wants full access to the single market. I think it recognizes it won't be a member of the single market. And the prime minister has said, we will lose the right to vote, the right to design it. But certainly, the British government's view is we should have access. Same regulations. Why would we not? And of course, this includes uh, uh, services, including financial services. Um, and I think you said in your remarks that uh, the Republic of Ireland will be Britain's best friend in phase two. You might have been tough in phase one, but in phase two, uh, you'll be there. Could we interpret from this that the Republic of Ireland might therefore be supportive of the UK? continuing to have full, unfettered access to the services markets as well uh, of the European Union, providing the UK follows the rules, providing there's regulatory alignment. Um, why the, the line that we seem to be hearing from certain European leaders that, oh, no, no, that, that doesn't fit into the kind of models of free trade agreements? I mean, what do you think? A lot in that. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, well, what I think is that, um, is that what we want out of this process, but also what I believe is, is best for Britain, but of course Britain will decide for itself uh, uh, what it wants, uh, is to have as close to the status quo as possible from a trading perspective. Um, that deals with the border issues in the island of Ireland. It means we don't have to trigger the default position which was negotiated before Christmas. Um, we want to see Britain uh, as close as possible to the single market. As, uh, uh, as can be negotiated. Uh, we want Britain to be part of a new um, uh, customs union partnership or customs union agreement, which will have to be redesigned, undoubtedly. Um, because at the moment, even if they wanted to be, you legally can't be a member of the customs union if you're not a member of the European Union. So, so either way, it's going to have to be redesigned. Uh, but the really important thing is that there is a signal of intent coming from Britain. Uh, based on what is realistic in terms of what, be, what can be negotiated, but also is ambitious in terms of its relationship with the largest single market in the world. Uh, and what I mean by realistic is, you know, the reason why the single market of the European Union is so attractive uh, is because that goes with EU membership. So the European Union was never solely an economic deal. 
It was about rights, responsibilities, opportunities that everybody shares in this one union. Britain's choosing to leave that union, uh, of course wants to hold on to the, to the trade benefits and trade opportunities uh, that it would have held as a member, still holds as a member, um, but has also expressed an ambition to negotiate its own free trade agreements all over the world. So I think there's going to be a choice that the British government will have to make, and I know there's a lot of intense discussion uh, on this uh, right now, uh, and that is where do the priorities for Britain lie? Uh, what is best for Britain here? Is it a close as possible relationship with a single market, mm. or is it going to be the ability to be able to negotiate free trade agreements on a bilateral basis all over the world, which in my view will result in it being impossible for them to negotiate as close as possible a relationship with the single market that will allow for barrier-free trade and border-free trade. Um, and that's why I think this choice um, is not a real choice when, when people say it's possible to have both. Um, so uh, you can have versions of both, yeah. but you can't have a complete barrier-free access into the single market and at the same time to be trying to negotiate competitive advantage for, your, for yourself that you will use to compete with people that are facilitating you uh, in terms of access into the single market. Like those two things don't go together. Why would the European Union want to facilitate that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to their disadvantage in the future? So, so that's why I think there are some mm -hmm. tough choices um, in terms of where does Britain's um, uh, future lie I I I in terms of benefit. For me, we would argue the case strongly uh, that I just and I've looked at it and I've really tried to understand the case that actually Britain would be better off with some ty type of hands-off free trade agreement doing its own thing globally uh, in terms of, of, of trade policy. I just don't see how the numbers add up yeah. for that. Um, and I believe if, uh, if the United Kingdom were to, to request a very close future relationship in terms of single market and customs union, I believe the European Union would respond generously to that. Uh, but that isn't the current position. Mm -hmm. The current position is we're leaving the single market, we're leaving mm -hmm. the, uh, the customs union, we want to negotiate our own free trade agreements. Um, and of course, if that, is, if that position is maintained, yes. or uh, sustain, uh, sustained, um, well then the European Union will, will simply negotiate accordingly. Mm -hmm. And what we'll have is a classic free trade agreement, yeah. uh, which in my view will not be a good outcome. Uh, certainly won't be a good outcome for Ireland, but I don't believe it'll be a good outcome for Britain either. Thank you. Very clear answer, I think, of the connectivity you made there between that ambition for, uh, as you said, for uh, unfettered free trade agreements and at the same time trying to retain the full access single market. That's where you see the potential conundrum. Right. Let's get some questions in. I'm sure I'm going to see lots of hands go up. Uh, and I may, given that we have to have a really hard finish just before quarter two, so you can catch your plane back, I'll take two or three uh, in a gap, in a group. So there's a gentleman there, gentleman here. I'll take two at the front and one there to start with. And then, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Colonel Rutten, Germany, a military attaché accredited to UK and to Ireland. I've got a question actually for the word that you've mentioned in your title, future. So when you are saying about the Good Friday Agreement, could you see a vision for the future even to come for the Good Friday Agreement formal for a unified Ireland? <laughs> You're trying to get me into trouble now. <laughs> I'll let, you, um, I'll let you, you take, no, you no, take so mean, reflect. Take that one first, quick, then we'll come. I can give a very quick answer to that. Um, the, any decisions in relation to the constitutional future of Northern Ireland, Ireland, and Britain uh, is uh, the rule book for that is very clear. It's the Good Friday Agreement, or it's often referred to uh, in London as the Belfast Agreement, um, uh, and it's a very democratic process, uh, and everybody has bought into that. Uh, a large majority of people on the island of Ireland, north and south, have voted for that. Uh, and so that's the rule book. Everybody knows how it works. Okay, let me take them in groups. First the question here, and then the lady here, please, and then I'll, I'll get to everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, Michael Harvey, um, member of Chatham House, and I'm really following on from the chairman's question because I didn't really hear much of an answer about financial services. The Delivery. Brexit terms will need to be agreed by all 27 countries, plus the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom will want tariff-free access for financial services. It's argued that Britain's economic dependency 
is on financial services. I've seen the explosive and indeed exponential growth of Dublin's financial services infrastructure in the last two years. I went there in 2015, 2017, last year, and it was phenomenal. So the question is, what will be Ireland's likely response to Britain's demands to protect this European financial services dominance? Okay. Hold that thought, I want to get a couple in if I can. Otherwise, yep, please, Madam Lady here. Hi, Fiona Mitchell from RTE News. Um, Tanishta, we've seen the kind of divisions that the Brexit vote has wrought and the UK cabinet here. Given that the Irish government is heading into a what's potentially going to be a very divisive abortion referendum. Do you fear divisions also developing within uh, the cabinet in Ireland, um, given that there are such a wide range of views around the cabinet table on the issue? Thank you. And just, there's a young gentleman there, just immediately there. Just trying to get a bit of all sorts uh, of diversity. Thomas Cole, Head of Policy at the pro-European group Open Britain. Uh, if the United Kingdom were to change its mind on Brexit, would you welcome the UK back in? <laughs> Why, why, why don't we take those three to start with, and I've got uh, folks over here afterwards. Yeah. Um, the last question first, because I, you know, I don't think it's a question that um, that people should discount entirely. Um, I think um, Donald Tusk is, is quoted as saying, "If Britain were to change her mind, she would be welcomed back with open arms." Um, I can tell you there would be no country celebrating more than Ireland would be. Um, but look, you know, these are, these, are, these are democratic choices. The British people voted in a referendum to leave. Um, if Britain decides to change its mind, that's a matter for Britain. But can I say that if they did choose that through whatever mechanism at some point in the future um, following, uh, I don't see that as a likely prospect. Mm. Uh, but should it happen, uh, I believe there would be uh, an extraordinarily generous approach from the rest of the European Union in response to that. I don't believe there would be any, I told you so. Um, mm. uh, instead, I think there would be uh, both a relief and, a, um, and, as I say, a very generous response. But I, I think it's a, I think certainly as we see it today, uh, I think it's unlikely. Um, in terms of uh, Fiona's question, I, I thought the issue of abortion might come up in somebody's question today. Um, can I say, we, you know, we had a very long cabinet meeting, uh, as you know, on Monday evening. Uh, to try to uh, provide some clarity to the country uh, in terms of, of how we were going to pr progress this issue. Uh, and there was uh, unanimity in the cabinet in terms of how we should move forward. Uh, we're going to hold a referendum, hopefully before the end of May. Um, everybody in the cabinet is supporting uh, a change to the Irish constitution uh, to remove Article 43.3. I support that too, strongly. Uh, I believe that the status quo in terms of how we treat women in crisis pregnancy in Ireland is totally unacceptable uh, and should, should change. And I hope the Irish people will support that change. I believe that this issue is too complex to attempt to deal with it in a wording in, in a written constitution. Uh, and so I believe that uh, the Dáil and Shannon should legislate uh, uh, for this difficult and complex and very emotive issue in, in Ireland, and this government wants to do that. Um, there are some differences of opinion in terms of the content of that legislation, but there's a lot more agreement than there is disagreement, I can assure you. Uh, we want to protect women. We want to protect their health. Uh, we want to provide services in Ireland that, unfortunately, many women have to leave Ireland to receive right now. Um, uh, and, of course, there will be a discussion around the responsibility of the state also to protect an unborn child. Uh, where, are the, where, are the, where are the lines? How do we prioritize women's health uh, and, and women's lives in that context, which, of course, we should, in my view. Um, so, um, so these are emotive issues, but I hope we will be able to have a debate this time around that isn't quite as divisive and as nasty as some of the campaigns in the past on this issue. And I certainly intend to to try to give some leadership, as I know the Taoiseach will, and Minister Harris and others who will be very involved in this debate, uh, to try to encourage and convince people that we need to make changes um, that, that are necessary uh, and recognize the, the negative consequences of the, the wording in the Constitution that's been there since 1983. 
So I think you, you, you'll actually find a lot of unity within the government on this issue. Uh, and there will be respect for some differences of opinion within the cabinet on this issue too, uh, in relation to the, the content of le the legislation that may come later. But the first challenge, and I think there's very strong unity within government on it, is to try and successfully carry a referendum to the people and get it passed. So that's that question. Um, in relation to, to financial services, I mean, I think um, uh, uh, I know how important financial services is, is uh, to the British economy. It's a huge part, uh, particularly of this city, um, which is a global center for financial services. And of course, financial service, services in Ireland have benefited from that. Uh, many of the big companies have satellite operations in Dublin. Um, uh, and uh, the relationship is very, very strong. Um, I think it will be a difficult negotiation for Britain, though, I have to say. Uh, I think the response will be, look, if you want the benefits of uh, remaining dominant in the context of European financial services, well, then there's an avenue open, you'd, open to you to do that, which is to remain part of an extended single market, which facilitates that. Uh, I think when, uh, when President Macron was, in, was in, um, uh, in Britain recently, I think he made that point very clearly as well. So you know, this negotiation requires choices to prioritize. Um, uh, being part of a single market is a privilege, and there are real economic benefits to that. Leaving a single market has consequences too. Uh, and that's why I think um, the reality of what's possible here needs to be the focus of political debate mm -hmm. over the next few months, as well as trying to uh, position um, Britain in the context of the final model that they'd like to negotiate. But, but as I say, I, I, I think there's a sort of a wait and see approach in the European Union at the moment, waiting to see what the, what the British government is actually asking for. Because I don't believe that, um, um, that the best outcome here will be delivered by simply saying we're leaving the customs union, leaving the single market, leaving the European Union, uh, and we're going to pursue our own global trade strategy. Um, you know, I think the consequences uh, for Britain in the context of the benefits of the single market uh, in the European Union uh, will be a big factor in those considerations. Okay, gentlemen, first there, and then here. Two on this side, because I haven't been to the side of the room yet. If I come here, yeah. Have you know, the microphone should be there, or who's got it? Oh, sorry, I'll start in the front. Sorry, I'll sorry. start the front. Sorry, sorry, I'll get that. Yep. Thank you, Minister. Welcome. Um, I'm picking up the word bridge that you used. Um, how seriously should we take the thought of a bridge between Ireland and Scotland, given that trade travels on wheels? And perhaps it might be an incentive for the UK to follow the Republic and go metric. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's hold that thought. Uh, microphone there, please. Uh, Andrew McKinley, a former member of the British Irish parliamentary body, not Brexit. Um, Eamon de Valera, 97 years ago, authored a document called Document Number Two, which had the concept of external association, uh, which is basically what the majority of Commonwealth countries have today. Uh, and uh, you alluded to uh, your predecessor, External Affairs Minister O'Higgins, who was one of the great architects of the Statute of Westminster, which is one of the cornerstones of the modern Commonwealth and so on. Isn't it time, please, that uh, consideration is given uh, to rejoining or taking your seat, which is just dormant, on the Commonwealth, uh, in the Commonwealth? Uh, <laughs> arguably, they didn't leave. It was just never picked up. There was a sort of intemperate time at time of... Uh, Costello's government, uh, and the, the chair is there. And uh, particularly as Ireland, those two statesmen of different sides have contributed so much to the development of the modern Commonwealth, which is a mutual association and no longer the British Commonwealth. If it's possible, I come right forward to you then. I'll be able to do three here, and then we'll come to this side of the room again. Yep. Uh, Sean Curtin, member of uh, Chatham House. Um, I would like to focus on uh, Northern Ireland. Um, the US input in the... Um, uh, no, uh, the Good Friday Peace Agreement was quite substantial. Uh, and I, I note that uh, Bill Clinton recently said he thought it was one of his greatest foreign policy achievements, his part in there. Uh, but I noticed that the Taoiseach at the beginning of this month um, 
made it clear that he didn't think that Donald Trump's, Donald Trump, President Trump's offer of intervention to help uh, in the current negotiations would be beneficial. Uh, and I wonder what your view is, um, particularly in the context, because I, I think that when it comes to Northern Ireland, the US in the past has been very helpful. Do you think that there is now a, perhaps a divergence of views between uh, England and Ireland over that? Thank you. I'm taking those three, and then I may have to do a last group after that. Yeah. Um, on Northern Ireland, um, the, the US has played a very significant role, as indeed has the EU. There have been very different types of roles, actually, um, in terms of political persuasion and trying to get deals across the line. And of course, you know, the role of people like George Mitchell has been absolutely instrumental uh, in Northern Ireland and, uh, and indeed the Clintons. And that's why they're loved in Ireland, um, both, um, both Bill and Hillary Clinton. Um, the, um, Having said that, though, I think the challenges in Northern Ireland are somewhat different now. Um, and if you spend time with the parties, as I do, and I'll be in Belfast again tomorrow evening, um, you see that actually there is, there is uh, a determination now, I think, to try and do it for themselves. You know, this is 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement. Um, there is a view, I think, that they don't need outsiders to come and be mediators and tell them what to do. Um, I think um, that Sinn Féin and the DUP, while of course the parties come from very different places and have a lot of um, different perspectives, uh, I think they are working together to try to negotiate the re-establishment of devolved government at the moment. It's not there yet, and um, um, so we need to be very cautious uh, in terms of how we comment on that. Um, but I, I just think we're living in a different time now, uh, and uh, the parties in Northern Ireland look for a different type of, of support. They're more self-confident about what they want. Uh, and, and, the, and of course, they've been involved in, in an assembly and in an executive on and off for the last two decades. So it is different. Uh, having said that, it would not be true to say that the US doesn't still have an impact in Northern Ireland. There are some very senior, uh, both congressmen and senators in the US, who take a very deep personal interest in what's happening in Northern Ireland. And I regularly phone them and brief them on what's happening. And they do contact different parties in Northern Ireland at different times to try and encourage them to do more. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't disregard that influence. Uh, in relation to, to Andrew, actually, ironically, the last time I was in Chatham, uh, Chatham House, I was asked the same question. Why doesn't Ireland join the Commonwealth? Uh, um, I, I rejoin, yeah. Uh, um, uh, in truth, um, there are some in Ireland who, um, who would advocate for that. Um, but I think it would be a difficult political sell right now. Uh, the perception in Ireland of the Commonwealth is that it's still the British Commonwealth, even though that's, of course, not the, the structure of the modern Commonwealth any longer. Um, so I think, um, you know, for Ireland, our Commonwealth is the, is the EU. <laughs> um, our voice in the world is through multilateral structures in the EU and the UN. Um, there may be some point in the future where we would consider that, but I, I think it's unlikely to, to feature seriously in, uh, in political discourse for the moment. Um, uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of a bridge between Ireland and, uh, and Britain, um, uh, well, uh, I, I mean, actually, there have been different proposals at different times. Uh, sometimes it's between Northern Ireland and Scotland. There's been people have looked at, you know, Dublin into Wales, uh, you know, Wexford into, into Wales. Uh, the, the, you know, look, these are huge capital expenditure projects. Uh, so I think we need to be very careful that we don't start creating an expectation around something that proves to be sort of a fantasy. But having said that, uh, I don't think we should discount these things. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know, the... The, uh, the flight travel between Dublin and London at the moment is four and a half million people a year. It's the second busiest route anywhere on the planet. And that includes cities that have 20 and 30 million people. So, you know, little old Ireland uh, and, uh, and obviously London, which is a huge uh, metropolis, uh, that, 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 that route is by far the busiest in Europe uh, and the second busiest in the world. So there's a huge appetite to move between the two islands. Uh, and of course, that, you know, not even counting the numbers in terms of ferries and all the rest of it. So, you, you know, um, I think if we're going to be serious about this, you know, you need to look at costing proposals uh, and then um, having a, 
serious dialogue on it in terms of shared cost and so on. But I wouldn't discount it. But I think it's important not to not to build up a build up a hope around something that um, that may be just unaffordable. Um, uh, that should be. I think I think the other questions. Yeah. yeah. Can I sque squeeze in a couple of last questions because um, you must go, and I'll leave you with with your timing a little bit, or I'll push it right a minute. But I'm, I'm just going to take two. I apologise. Lots of hands are up, but I'm going to take the lady there and the young gentleman here, and I apologise for those many other people I haven't got. If you want to take three or four, I'll give quicker answers the next. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. One of your one of your staffs going to give me a really hard time on that. Yep. <laughs> I'd like a, an answer that isn't quick. Um, I believe you spent an hour and 15 minutes with Philip Hammond um, this afternoon. So I'm wondering if you can give, a, give us any sort of um, indication as to whether um, his vision of Brexit is something that is getting uh, a little bit more traction um, uh, in, the, in the Tory party, given how roundly he was dismissed in the past few days. Gentlemen here. If the EU, uh, the UK does keep a close relationship with the EU, it will likely want a say somehow, even without a vote, in how the EU legislates, regulates. Would you welcome a UK representative in the room? How do you see that working? And um, I must ask one last question. One colleague, Lisa from Chatham House, the front here. I'm Patricia Lewis from Chatham House. Uh, well, I'd like to see the ferry between Cork and Swansea re-established. Um, <laughs> but... Um, <coughs> I wanted to ask you about security and defence issues. Uh, the relationship between Britain and Ireland on security and defence has really improved, it's really increased. Uh, there are major issues uh, for both countries, not least of which is cyber security, and I wonder if you could talk about that relationship going forward. Thanks. If I could just tack one on at the end, because yep. the question hasn't been asked. If the UK is not able to strike the kind of regulatory alignment that the December 8th agreement implied would be achieved, what are the kinds of powers that Stormont has that might enable continued collaboration on the island of Ireland, yeah, that might obviate that? Yeah. Um, All in about two minutes, I think, uh, by the look <laughs> on the front floor. <laughs> Clearly, I haven't given enough headlines uh, <laughs> to, to today. Um, first of all, it's the third time that I've met Philip Hammond at length. Um, and. Um, it was a very good and very honest conversation uh, in terms of what's possible and what's not. Uh, he is one of the key decision makers in the British government, but he is, he's one of, but there are others too, of course. Um, uh, and um, so, you know, I, I think it would be wrong for me to go into the detail of that meeting, to be honest. Um, I also had, I mean, I had quite long meetings with a number of other cabinet ministers today also. Um, so I don't want to single out one of the conversations. I, I think that would be unfair to Philip, um, um, but I, uh, um, so far as to say that I think that, you know, I have made the case, and I mean it, that Ireland is a friend of Britain, these negotiations, even though we're on the other side of the negotiating table, and we will maintain solidarity with our, with our EU um, colleagues. Um, but we do, I think, play a very unique role. Uh, Ireland understands Britain well. Mm. Uh, many of us have lived here, worked here, studied here. Uh, I have many very, very good friends um, uh, that are British. Uh, and uh, I think that we do have to play a role in ensuring that the EU understands the British mindset in the context of what's possible in these negotiations. Um, and, um, and I wouldn't discount that influence uh, uh, in the context of the very difficult negotiation period that's, that's coming up in the next few weeks. Um, Britain needs a uh, say in the single market if it's going to be part of it. I can understand that. You know, I don't see Britain ever being part of something that essentially, you know, the rules of which are decided by somebody else. Britain is too, too powerful, too big, too proud for that. Um, and uh, so, uh, so of course, that that has to be part of of any negotiated outcome or solution. Um, uh, and um, uh, you know, I think that's that's understood. Um, the, um, I'd like the, the Cork Swansea ferry back as well, although I'm, I'm glad to say that in the last few weeks we've seen a, a Cork Santander ferry being launched. Uh, so we're, we're reaching out um, <laughs> directly to, to the EU. Um, the, uh, in terms of uh, security and defence, actually, yeah, when I was defence minister, uh, I signed with my counterpart here the first memorandum of understanding on defence. Um, there is a lot of quiet 
and professional cooperation happening between Ireland and Britain right now on security and defense issues, and so there should be. Because if you share a common travel area, uh, if you allow free movement uh, between two islands, as, as we will continue to do post-Brexit, well then, you have to share information uh, on core security issues mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we have a role in protecting British citizens, just like British, uh, the British authorities have a role in protecting Irish citizens in Ireland, uh, if there's going to be a constant churn and movement uh, of people between these two islands. Uh, and so that, that's not undermining Irish uh, you know, military neutrality or any of that stuff. This is practical cooperation between neighbors. Uh, and we do a lot of it. Um, we also, on the defense side, train together at times. Uh, we look at uh, joint uh, procurement at times in certain areas. And of course, more recently, I'm glad to say, because I've been involved in it, uh, we've, we have uh, worked together on joint peacekeeping missions. Uh, we worked together on the, on the Ebola crisis in West Africa. Um, and we'll continue, if I have anything to do with it anyway, to look to try to do things together uh, as two countries that are, that are, that are closely tied uh, and, can, um, and can impact positively in other parts of the world. Um, in terms of uh, that kind of veiled question uh, uh, of, um, uh, look, you know, we, there was a tough negotiation before Christmas. Um, we made it very clear, and we had been making it very clear, by the way, for months in advance, mm -hmm. that we couldn't allow the process to move on to phase two and talk about trade until we had at least some basic mm -hmm. certainties uh, so that we could say to Irish people you know, that there is a floor here that we cannot fall below or fall through mm -hmm. in the context of protecting core issues like a peace process um, that is very much linked to an invisible border really on the island of Ireland. Um, and because of that strength of feeling, uh, I think it became clear that this process was not going to move on because we had very strong solidarity with our EU colleagues on that particular issue. Um, and, uh, and I think we agreed a very um, good uh, uh, document uh, that has provided a lot of reassurance. Uh, but some of that reassurance are fallback positions. Yeah. They're not what we want. Mm. Uh, they are what we will have to accept if we can't get political agreement. Right in terms of what we want. So what we want here uh, is a negotiated uh, uh, trade arrangement and future relationship that allows the further border issue to be solved, that allows for the east-west trade, mm. the 65 billion euros of trade, three, you know, 1.3 billion a week of trade between Ireland and Britain to continue uninhibited without barriers, um, that allows the 100,000 store cattle from the west of Ireland to cross the border into Northern Ireland to be finished on Northern Ireland farms that allows half, uh, half a million lambs produced on Northern Ireland farms to come south of the border to be slaughtered in Irish factories. This is the kind of normality that is the consequence of a peace process that's working. And that's what we're looking to protect. Uh, and that's why we had to have that insurance or fallback default position, if you like. Uh, but that is not... Uh, something that we want to trigger early, uh, that is simply an insurance mechanism that if all else fails, uh, we will have to insist uh, becomes a reality. Uh, and I think that's understood pretty well in London. Thank you very much, Tanishta. You've uh, navigated some really diverse questions. Uh, you've covered a lot, and we're only five minutes over. I hopefully I won't get punished too much for letting that happen. Um, you, I thought, mixed extremely well the balance of realism that's going to be required for this to move forward effectively with a real sense of the deep historical personal connections that have got to make this work. Uh, we appreciate that you've taken the time with our members here at Chatham House for a third time um, and we hope to welcome you back again and hopefully there will be under good constructive circumstances. Thank you very much. Please stay in your seat so we can let the finish her out.